Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we continue in our study, as we are looking at the, the situation that we need to understand regarding character and covenant, and how this is presented with what is considered minor prophets, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance? Shall we seek for understanding and for his wisdom so that we may come to a clearer understanding of that that he would have us to know for this time in our earth's history? Shall we seek him now in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble before you, to come before you, to understand that which you would have us to know. Guide us now. Direct us, each one. Help us that our minds may be open, that we may be willing to be led by you in the path that you would have us to walk upon. We recognize, Father, that we have a choice. We can either walk in the light that is shown behind us, or if we choose, we walk in according to the sparks of our own kindling. Help us to walk in your light. I ask today, Father, that you'll hide me behind your cross. Help me so that it is your words that are presented. That what is said is according to your will. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us and open our minds so that we might understand more clearly that which we need for this time. Bless each one attending this meeting. Bless those that will attend this and view this later via the internet. Help us now. For this we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I was preparing and being led to prepare for, for this presentation, I listened to an older study of Elder Jeffs. He gave reference to a portion of this manuscript, which you can see is classed as non-published, and there was a small portion of it that was published in six manuscript release, page 394. Now, as we have also noted in the past, there are other copies of this document that can only be viewed at the main office of the Ellen White Estate because they contain handwritten notes that Mrs. White had made. The first several paragraphs of this document are very important based upon the study that we were engaged in this last week. So we're going to approach this carefully, paragraph by paragraph. I'm going to be very interested in your consideration as we address these items. The nation of Israel was God's church, and special directions were given regarding his claims upon it. Now, I think this statement gives us a very clear understanding of how God views church. Does he say, that? does Mrs. White here say, from God, that the temple in Jerusalem was God's church. 
doesn't look like it. Okay. Jesus Christ was the invisible leader of the children of Israel in their wilderness wandering. The congregation numbered more than a million people. And they must have needed continual instruction. This was not withheld from them. Are we any different today than were the children of Israel then? Maybe more headstrong. Okay, do we need continual instruction? Absolutely. Amen. To them were committed the laws of heavenly origin, God's holy oracles. It was of great importance that they should know and understand the purposes of heaven concerning them. Now, let's pay attention to what was just read. That these laws of heavenly origin, God's holy oracles, were of great importance. Because this is going to be necessary for us to understand in a following paragraph. They must be educated before they were given position, possession of the vineyard. God's directions and requirements were written out in plain terms. And these were to be impressed on their minds by every possible means. By pleasant methods of instruction, the children were also to be taught. As soon as they could speak, they were to be taught to sing the words of instruction Christ had given to Moses. <clears throat> it's, just, it, it's kind of interesting that this is being said. That the children were taught by song the laws that had been given to Moses. Certain men were appointed to perform certain parts of the holy service. Moses and Aaron and his sons were most closely connected with the sanctuary service. They were to minister before the tabernacle of witness. The Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of the priesthood. What does that mean to us today as Levites? How are we to bear the iniquity of the sanctuary? How are we to bear the iniquity of the priesthood? You shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, and there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. Thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given you your priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Now, Aaron and his sons are given this information, this warning in the book of Numbers. And Numbers follows Leviticus, right? Right. The tribe of Levi was given a specially significant position. They were to unite with others in taking charge of the tabernacle. Thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, God said, bring thou with thee, that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee, but thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. Behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord, to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. They shall keep thy charge, and the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar, that neither they 
nor ye also die. They shall be joined unto thee, and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle, and a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. <coughs> Excuse me. Christ, the great teacher, gave every specification necessary to show the people that they were not to become jealous of their brethren thinking that they had placed themselves in an exalted position. God himself had appointed men to do him service. Men were not managing, but God. What does that mean to you? We're supposed to use God's wisdom, not our own. Amen. Now, would we all agree with that? Oh, man. Yes. Okay. So now, a special blessing was promised the Israelites on condition that they were obedient to the divine laws. God declared that he would be with them as long as they, in simplicity, obeyed his statutes and judgment as long as pure, undefiled religion prevailed among them in their public service and family relations. <clears throat> the divine laws were given for their good to preserve health, unity, peace, and purity. If obeyed, these statutes would give them temporal as well as spiritual advantages. Christ gave his commandments and then declared that those who did them would live in them. This statement he repeated when he was here upon earth. A lawyer came to him with the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Christ asked him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? The lawyer answered, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all the and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as them as thyself thou hast answered right christ said this do and thou shalt live now please observe that in the lawyer's answer you have a four step situation heart soul strength mind Can we make application here to the message of Revelation 14 and the message of Revelation 18? Spiritual and temporal prosperity was to be granted to the Israelites on condition of obedience. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live in them. Romans 10.5 And he declared to the people, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turneth away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over the Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, 
and then thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days. We find this in Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 20. Now, why is that important? Why is it important that this portion from the Apostle Paul is now being combined with this portion of Deuteronomy spoken by Moses? Well, God's blessings and cursings uh, will last throughout the ages. We're, we're accountable for every word in his, in his, word, in his book. Okay. So we're accountable only to the Ten Commandments, right? Oh, we're accountable. Broderick. <laughs> Angela first, Ron second, please. Oh, sorry. I just said it spreads more than like the ten are very, very brief, right? Very curt, but you get the overall view through the entire word. Amen. I would say it would be responsible for all of them. Anyway. Okay. Thank you, William. Now, special laws were given to the Israelites in regard to the tilling of the soil. What has Mrs. White said here? We're about to look here at Leviticus 25, verses 1 to 7. Is she telling us that this portion of Leviticus carries as much weight as Exodus chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments? Uh, yes. The Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shalt thou sow thy field, and six years shalt thou prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord, Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. Leviticus 25, 1-7. Can I ask a question, do I? <clears throat> Please. Where it says that, um, the, and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you. Is that talking about, is it talking about just for the servants and the maid, or is that talking about you as yourself as well? It's talking about everyone. Okay. Here's the thing. If we are to observe this as a Sabbath for the land, what is our responsibility? Consider this as we as we read the next paragraphs. It's to allow the land to rest. That's and, hard. Okay, but who else rests then when the land is resting? All we do. Everybody. And the servants. Not everybody. just that, the, the animals as well. Right. These laws seem peculiar to those who have not known God's statutes. But the Lord knew better than man what arrangements to make with his people. These laws were written down, and the seventh year after they settled in Canaan was to be a Sabbath year. Is this statement clear? Pretty clear. So 
they were to work six years and observe a sabbatical year in the seventh year. That's the way it's written. <clears throat> so while the land rested, man was to rest. Yeah, it's teaching us how to keep Sabbath during a regular week cycle. Isn't this interesting that <clears throat> we wind up seeing this where we have six days to labor and a day to rest. Now for the land, we have six years to labor and a year to rest. Mrs. White continues, all agricultural business was to stop. There was to be no planting or sowing. For one year, the people were to depend wholly on the Lord, having faith in his arrangements as the householder. The land needed a rest in order to renew the forces necessary for growth. That which grew of itself was the common property of the poor and the stranger the cattle, and the herds. Thus the land was to receive rest and the poor and the cattle a feast. This was to show that nature was not God, that God controlled nature. God designed that from nature his church should constantly learn important lessons. They were to cherish a vivid sense that God was the manager, the householder. They were to know the reality of his presence and his providential care over all of the earth. They were to realize that all nature was under his supervision and all the productions of the ground under his ministration. This was to give them faith in his providence he could withhold his blessings or he could bestow them. Every 50th year, the year of Jubilee, every inheritance in the land was to be restored to its original owner. In the year of Jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession, God declared in verse 13. Thus, in his infinite wisdom, God the Lord Jehovah, educated his people. His requirements were not arbitrary. <clears throat> Connected with all the instruction received by the people from the source of all light was the consequence of obedience and disobedience. Now, as we have studied where do we find the consequences of obedience and disobedience? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. We have just been reading from Leviticus 25. Where do we find in the Bible what we would call the blessings and the curses. Well, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. Is this not the section from which Father Miller drew his understanding of the seven times of the 2520? What would you say? They were taught that obedience would bring them the richest spiritual grace and would enable them to distinguish between the sacred and the common. Disobedience would bring its sure result. If the people chose to manage the land in their own supposed wisdom, they would find that the Lord would not work a miracle to counteract the evils he was trying to save them from. Now,
Is this not the same as the method of Bible study versus, you know, when, when, when we look at Father Miller's understanding using proof text versus all of the other methods that are currently being promoted? If we choose to manage our Bible study in our wisdom rather than God's, what result are we going to have? I would say a negative result. Right. So here we are. We're being shown that the blessings and the curses, Leviticus 25 and 26, were for the good of the children of Israel. Now, were these instructions part of God's law? Well, yes. I mean, well, special instructions. Okay. Do they have bearing upon us today? I would say yes. Okay. The Lord presented to his people the course that they must pursue if they would be a prosperous, independent nation. If they obeyed him, he declared that health and peace would be theirs. And under his supervision, the land would yield its increase. The tithing system was instituted by the Lord as the very best arrangement to help the people in carrying out the principles of the law. If this law were obeyed, the people would be entrusted with the entire vineyard, the whole earth. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments, he declared, and ye shall dwell in this land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if ye shall say, what shall, eat, what shall we eat the seventh year? <clears throat> Behold, we, not, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. Then will I command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall not sow the eighth year and eat yet of the old fruit until the ninth year until her fruits come in ye shall eat of the old store here is God giving a promise that we don't need to worry when he commands his blessings if we are keeping his laws, they were not to sow, they were not to reap in that seventh year. They were to allow the land to rest. They were to take rest for themselves as well. Yet God was going to provide for them. The children of Israel were given laws and regulations which would give all nations on the earth a true idea of God's kingdom and government. As a nation, as families, as individuals, they were to obey these laws. They were to be a kingdom of priests and princes. Those who felt their entire dependence on God, looking to him for instruction and relying upon him for power to carry out his plans in the vineyard, they were to cultivate would receive the largest blessing and revenue. Brothers and sisters, did God not show in this that he is in charge and that we need to trust in him? Is this also not an element of righteousness by faith. Totally.
if we are willing to be led of God, if we are willing to trust in him, not in ourselves, not in our own ideas, not in our own methods, will we be blessed? Amen. Adam and Eve lost Eden. Because of their sin, the land was cursed. Yet if God's people obeyed his requirements and followed his directions in regard to tilling the soil, the land would be brought back to a prosperous and beautiful condition. Here, she is tying this instruction of Moses directly back to the earliest part of Genesis with Adam and Eve. Does God change? No, he doesn't. Therefore, was this in the tilling of the land, the seventh year Sabbath for the land, was this incumbent upon Adam and Eve as it was upon the children of Israel? <coughs> I would think so. I would have to agree. Men were to cooperate with God in restoring the diseased land to health, that it might be a praise and a glory to his name. And as the land they possessed would be, would, if managed with skill and earnestness, produce its treasures, so their hearts, if controlled by God, would reflect his character. There's that strange word again, character. But if because of selfishness and covetousness, men felt capable of managing without the wisdom of God, if they looked upon the land as their own and refused to give it a Sabbath, it would lose its vigor and dearth and sickness would testify to their disobedience. Man has looked upon the word of God as his own and has at times modified the word of God to suit their own ideas. Much like how man has looked upon the land. In the laws which God gave for the cultivation of the soil, he was giving the people opportunity to overcome their selfishness and become heavenly minded. Canaan would be to them as Eden if they obeyed the word of the Lord. Through them, the Lord designed to teach all the nations of the world how to cultivate the soil so that it would yield healthy fruit free from disease. The earth is the Lord's vineyard and is to be treated according to his plan. Those who cultivated the soil were to realize that they were doing God's service. They were as truly in their lot and place as when men were appointed to minister in the priesthood and in work connected with the tabernacle. God told the people that the Levites were a gift to them and no matter what their trade, they were to help support them. Especially were those tilling the soil to bring in the rich treasures of the earth for the sustenance of the Levites. <clears throat> the poor of the congregation of Israel were not left to haphazard feelings or impulses. God declared, you are to cultivate the land six years, but the seventh year, leave it to me. During that time, it is to be cared for by me. There is to be no planting or sowing, no reaping or gathering. All who, were, who would were to use 
what the ground produced. The poor were to partake of its spontaneous productions, and the stranger was to have free access to them. Thus did the Lord provide a table for the poor. Let those who believe the word of the Lord read the instruction contained in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So we're talking here Leviticus 25 and 26 and Deuteronomy 30, are we not? Uh, yeah. There they will learn what kind of an education was to leave its impress on the families of the nation of Israel. God's chosen people were to stand forth distinct and holy, separate from the nations who knew not God. But they were given directions to treat the stranger kindly. He was not to be looked down on because he was not of Israel. The Israelites were to love the strangers because Christ died as verily to save them as he did to save Israel. The Lord God of Israel would receive them if they chose the society of those who knew and acknowledged him. In this way, they would learn of Jehovah and glorify him as they beheld his works in behalf of his chosen people. God declared, If thy brother be poor and fallen into decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger and a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take not thou usury of him or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt to give thee the land of Canaan and to be thy God. Leviticus 25, 35 to 38. God will reveal himself as the friend of justice and mercy. He has always, he always has been and always will be the enemy of selfishness and covetousness. No one can obtain his favor and blessing who practices fraud, opposing his brother, or a stranger, because it's in his power to do so. We have many that have stood against brother and against sister. Mrs. White here is reiterating that those that do this can not obtain the favor and the blessing of God. Too many times, people have looked to simply ask questions and have been shut down. This is not according to God's order. We are searching and seeking for that upper room experience of the early church. In so doing, we must be free to ask so that we may understand. God blesses those who only love mercy, showing this not only in the word, but in deed, giving evidence by their courtesy and kindness that they walk with God. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow thyself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with the calves of a year old? With the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of the soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what does the lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy god micah 6 6 to 8 <clears throat> now there's quite a bit more to this document but the overarching point is this instruction 
that we find in Leviticus 25 and 26. Mrs. White has tied with Exodus 20. She has tied this with the understanding of the 10 promises that are presented and has expanded upon them to include the land with the man. Now, does anyone have a point or a problem with what I've just presented? Well, what exactly are you saying more directly from that? Okay. Very directly, what I'm saying is that we have a situation as we look at this because within the church using man's wisdom rather than god using their methods of study rather than god's method yeah so you're using the rest of the land as an illustration of that yes i am All of this situation has been that when they are when when the learned doctors of the law of today are choosing to say that there is no such thing as the seven times of Leviticus twenty five and twenty six, they are setting aside the fact that Mrs. White very directly in this document applies the seven times that we find in this portion of scripture as being just as valid as the Ten Commandments. Now, last week, we came to this portion of Hosea. We did not address it. Here, we are being told that they have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold, they have made them idols, that they may be cut off. Here we have a situation. For it says that more than half a century after the death of Elisha, the kings of Israel continued to abuse the most sacred rights of the Hebrew economy and to violate the laws of Jehovah. Now, at this time, after the death of Elisha, which of course is after Elijah has been taken to heaven. It states that the kings of Israel continued to abuse the most sacred rights of the Hebrew economy and to violate the laws of Jehovah. At this time, as we are looking at scripture, was the land being allowed to rest? Probably not. Well, I would have to say definitely not. It wasn't since 1 Samuel uh, 8 when Saul was brought in. So we are dealing with a time period here. When was Saul inaugurated, anointed as king of Israel, according to the work that Brother Stephen had done? Oh, 1097. Okay. When was the princes of Judah taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar? That's 607. How many years were there between 
the inauguration of Saul and the captivity of Judah. Was that the 490? Yes. So 70 sabbatical cycles. 70 sabbatical cycles, 490 years. In Daniel 9, how many years are accounted unto thy people? 70. Sabbatical cycles. Correct. Together. So if there's 70 sabbatical cycles, again, how many years are there? 490. Okay. What kind of a symbol then is 490? Well, so it's a symbol of 49. You've got, okay, you've got 49, I agree. Which is the number of years between the Jubilees. Would it be part of the scattering? Okay, possibly. It's, uh, that 49 is also the Feast of Weeks. Right. It's also connected to seven. Okay. Um, there's a number of years between 622 and 537. Okay. That's uh, that's 49. 490. Could we... I got this. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. Please finish your thought. So we got 490, which is the 70 weeks of Daniel 924. We got judgment. That's what we decided 490 stand for would be judgment. Um, 490 years between 457 and 34 AD. It was the number of years between Saul and 1097 and 607. Um, it was 490 years of no rest for the land. Um, 49 times 10, which 10 being a symbol for judgment. Um, seven times 70. And then, uh, oh, well, it was the days of the closing of Lambert Church on September 11th and January 13th, 2021. Those are all the 490s that I got. Okay. The 49s. What was your point? Okay. From the chat, very quickly, and then to a point. As Brother Aran has, has pointed out from Matthew 18 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Mm hmm. But we have a period of 490 from 457 to 34. Right? Yes. Now, is 490 then a probationary time? Hmm. I'm yes, supposing that we could, we could look at it like that. Okay. Under the guidance of the kings of Israel, the land did not rest until God decreed that Israel and Judah should be in captivity. And then the land was allowed to rest, correct? Correct. That's right. 
for now 70 you, cycles. For 70, for, for the 70 sabbatical cycles that it was supposed to enjoy its rest. You know, I was going to say that, but I, I, I just did. I apologize. No, you're fine. The children of Israel, through the prophet Daniel, were led to understand that they had a probationary period to prepare themselves for the coming of the Messiah. Right? Oh, okay. For on the 1843 chart, do we not show 457? Yes. Have we not, with a, a clearer understanding that follows that of the pioneers, come to understand that 457, which is prominent on the 1843 chart, and again prominent on the 1850 chart, is a waymark for us to understand that this began the time for the literal nation of Israel to understand that its Messiah was soon to come. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Yes, it would. So, yeah. when we are dealing with the 70th week here, the nation of Israel should have understood the time of its visitation. Should have. Not completely. I mean, some did because of all the, uh, the things that were going on. Okay. At this point, Are we not today representatives of the children of Israel for this time? That's what we're supposed to be. Okay. Now, in this, in this 490 year period, there was ample opportunity for all of Israel to have studied to understand the law and the instruction that God had given. <clears throat> Yet very few chose to accept how God was leading them. They became more hard-hearted. They were not accepting God's leadership. They accepted the leadership of the men that were around them. God had made his people the depositories of his grace, but losing sight of this purpose, they dealt treacherously against the Lord and with one another. It was a time of violence and bloodshed. King after king was assassinated to make way for others ambitious to rule. They have set up kings, the Lord declared, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Every principle of justice was set aside until king and people were held in contempt by the surrounding nations. The whole point about the Jewish economy was for them to understand that God had ordained that you work six days and on the seventh you rest. Then you would have the land resting in the seventh year. So many of the, of the instructions that God gave, whether you're talking about 
the seventh day, the seventh week, the seventh month, or the seventh year have been set aside by many within the world. God does not change. We need to have a clearer understanding of these items along with the time of probation that he has granted to us for us to come into a clearer understanding of what he would require of us today. The children of Israel, after more than a half a century after the death of Elisha, were continuing down a path of their own making. They were choosing to ignore the light that God had given. May this not be said of us. Ever since the rending of the kingdom, the Israelites had been sowing the wind. Now they were to reap the whirlwind. Ever since the divisions that have been occurring within the movement, are we sowing the wind or are we looking to sow as God would have us to sow? Ye have plowed wickedness, the Lord declared. Ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Hosea 10, 13-15 The closing years of the ill-fated kingdom of Israel were marked with violence and bloodshed such as never been witnessed even in the worst periods of strife and unrest under the house of Ahab. For two centuries and more, the rulers of the ten tribes had been sowing the wind. Now they were reaping the whirlwind. King after king were assassinated to make way for others ambitious to rule. They have set up kings, the Lord declared, of these godless usurpers, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Every principle of justice was set aside. Those who would have stood before the nations of earth as the depositories of divine grace dealt treacherously against the Lord and with one another. With severest reproofs, God sought to arouse the impenitent nation to a revital realization of its imminent danger of utter destruction. Does God want people to be lost? No. But yet there will be those that choose their own path and are lost because of their own decisions, correct? Correct. Through Hosea and Amos, he sent the ten tribes message after message, urging full and complete repentance and threatening disaster as the result of continued transgression. Ye have plowed wickedness, declared Hosea. Ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all the fortresses shall be spoiled. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Hosea 10, 13 to 15. Thy calf, O Samaria, hast cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? 
For from Israel it was also, the workmen made it. Therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Why is it important that the calf of Samaria is being referenced here? Uh, speaking of the, uh, the apostasy of Jeroboam. Agreed. And where did he set up his, these golden calves? In Dan and Bathsheba. Uh, I would respectfully disagree. I believe it was in Dan and Bethel. That's right. Oh, Beth, okay. Dan and Bethel. I'll check. Now, in this situation, Dan means what? Does it not mean judge? And if Dan means judge, what does Beth El mean? House of God. You guys are right. Continue, please. <laughs> Turn to First Kings twelve, and I'm. I just read about it. I just skimmed it. Okay. These calves were set up. Judge, and the house of God. Are we to have an idol in the house of God, and will a idol be our judge uh no and uh, no so when jeroboam did this was he not symbolically speaking directly against himself yes From generation to generation, the Lord bore with his wayward children until he could do no more for them. O Ephraim, he cried, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. Do we want our righteousness to be like the early do. Is this the righteousness that Christ is offering us? The evils that had overspread the land and permeated all classes of society had become incurable. And upon Israel was pronounced the dread sentence. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. Hosea 9, 7. Then shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of the chimney. Hosea 13.3 Israel was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent of its sins. God has labored long with Israel. God has labored long as well with those that would choose to set aside his word. Thy calf, O Samaria, has, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. <clears throat> the, 
the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon. For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it, it shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jereb. Hosea 10, 5 and 6. Through Amos also, the Lord clearly revealed his purpose to bring judgments upon his impenitent people. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city? And the Lord hath not done it. The Lord roared. The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken. Who can but prophesy? How can we tie this back with the lion that roared against Samson? How can this warning be applied with what we have been dealing with out of the book of Judges. The question is being asked here, will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? How was this being applied as Samson was walking into the area of the Philistines? Well, it's a cry of judgment against them. Okay. Any other thought on that? I mean, we were applying this with Samson in the ironic sense. So if this is if this is a cry of judgment, who is the cry of judgment coming against? Well, it was roaring against Samson. Okay. If Samson was a type of Christ... What judgment would befall him? Well, he's bearing our own sins, but while we're in the sealing time, God is being judged too. Okay. Again, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? So much of this, line upon line, yet needs to be explored, needs to be addressed so that we may more clearly understand that which has been presented for our admonition, for our ed edification at this time. Wouldn't, wouldn't that go on the line be trying to warn Sam, Samson from from um, the course he was taking with the women of the Philistines. And what would the women of the Philistines represent? Apostate Protestantism. Okay. Apostate churches, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. 
That's just my thought, so I don't know. Okay. Christ dealt with his church, right? When he came to earth initially, he came to give a warning and a blessing to his own people because they at that at that point had a small time left of probation Did he not give words of warning to the nation of Israel of his time? We must consider this more carefully as we continue in this study of the book of Judges. From generation to generation, the Lord hath borne with his wayward children. And even now, in the face of defiant rebellion, he still longed to reveal himself to them as willing to save. O Ephraim, he cried, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. The evils that had overspread the land had become incurable. And upon Israel was pronounced the dread sentence. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. <clears throat> the days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. Hosea 4, 17 and 9, 7. Now, as these passages were being considered, I found this very interesting. The majority of prophets and kings was compiled after the death of Mrs. White. This particular paragraph is found only within prophets and kings. There is no earlier document that contains this, at least none of the published documents. The ten tribes of Israel were now to reap the fruitage of the apostasy that had taken form with the setting up of the strange altars at Bethel and at Dan. God's message to them was, Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to in innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workmen made it. Therefore, it is not of God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of beth Aven, For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it. It shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob, who is Sennacherib. Hosea 8, 5, and 6, and 10, 5, and 6. The ten tribes were to reap this fruitage. They were to reap the harvest of the apostasy that had taken form with the setting up of the strange altars at Bethel and at Dan. When we're looking at this, what Strange fruitage. What fruitage is reaped 
of strange altars currently from the church and from this within the movement. Could we not see that the method of biblical interpretation that has been abandoned by setting up man's wisdom as superior to the method that God has given could be one of those golden calves accepted at the house of God, accepted at Bethel. Seems entirely plausible. Okay, could we also not see that this choosing to cast out brothers and sisters when they disagree with them is in the same way a golden idol set up at Dan? So what were the two greatest commandments? Love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself. Do you see either of those in those uh, images of the uh, bulls? Wouldn't you say that that's the exact opposite? Well, isn't this again a strange altar? Absolutely. Brothers and sisters. A warning message is soon to be given as we are shown in, in Ezekiel 8 and 9. Where is that message to begin? House of God. Yes. Before whom? The ancient men and um, the house, the congregation. Right. <clears throat> Too often. We have had those that would be accepting of whatever their pastor says. Yet, what does Paul tell us? Are we not told to study, to show thyself approved unto God? Where does the responsibility lie? Does our responsibility lie with our pastor, or does our responsibility lie with ourselves? I'd say both. Why? Well, the, the, the shepherds are supposed to protect and lead the flock rightly, and if they're not, then, as Ellen White said, in the end, they'll be ripped to pieces. But we are, each one of us, obliged to study for ourselves. And to accept God's word above man's in all things. Amen. Here. We see the issue. That has been occurring. Within the church. And within the movement. We do not need to be reaping the fruit of apostasy. It is incumbent upon us to understand that yes, as you sow, so shall ye reap. If we are sowing 
the seeds that God would have sown, will we not honor him and honor our neighbor as ourselves? It was one of the things that, that always bothered me in the situation with Parminder and Tess, in the situations with Mark Bruce, in the situations with Emiliano, that there was always so much secrecy. So many would be drawn into a private situation, a secret conversation, they would be lifted up as being worthy for the secrets to be divulged unto them. Does God do anything in secret? Not that he would tell us about. No, and I have a book on warfare prayer that mentions that cliques like that are of Satan. This is why when we have these studies, they are open to all. The studies are placed into the record. They are placed so that if there is an issue, if something comes up and something is said that is not correct, we can then publicly announce and publicly address the error. Correct. There are those that will not want to have their errors publicly addressed. Will be? Are. We cannot afford to reap the fruits of apostasy. We seek the upper room experience. For how did the apostles approach this experience prior to Pentecost? Did they not approach it with prayer and the confession of sins over the, the, the nine days prior to Pentecost? That's what it appears. Are we also not being given a time so that we may then come together so that we may approach the throne of grace to be made ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But this requires us to come together in unity. Disunity is the fruitage of apostasy. Pointing fingers at brothers and sisters is the fruitage of apostasy. Because it does not recognize the fact that if you point one, you have three others pointed right back at you. All of these messages, all that have been being presented on these Sabbath sessions. I have seen the need for these changes in my own life. 
I'm not willing to point fingers at anyone else. For I recognize my sin. I do not want for apostasy to be found within me. This is the call that is made to all today. For we do not wish, we do not desire to have God's word come against us as it did against the nation of Israel. Any idol that we have needs to be removed for the spirit of God to be able to take its rightful place in our lives. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? Yes, when we began to read this, I was thinking where, where God says he changes not. And then I thought, that's why the judgment, when he is destroying the wicked, is a strange act to him because it's not according to his nature. And that's why he's also pleading, oh, Israel, why will you die? Like he's mentioning everything he's done to lead them to repentance. And they keep resisting him. And I'm just praying that it doesn't happen with us. Agreed. Any other thoughts or questions at this time? Let us now close with prayer. Loving Father in heaven, all have sinned. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. Help us, Father, that we may come before you in spirit and in truth learning that that you would have us to understand direct us now father so that we may not hold onto idols but that we may take hold of you that your righteousness may be accepted by us. That by faith, we may take hold of Christ so that it is your character and his character that others see. So that we may truly enter into covenant with you. Direct us now, guide us in all things on this Sabbath day. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.